Hello one and all, and welcome to our very first Faculty Lounge Live, where we are ex taking and exploring the journeys of our FAU faculty in teaching online. I'm your host this week, Miguel Palacios, and I, am the, I have the pleasure of bringing in our very first guest. We have, uh, she is the Assistant Chair of the Mathematics and Science Department. She is a Senior Instructor of Mathematics Dr. Papia Bhattacharjee. How are you doing today, Dr. Bhattacharjee? I'm doing great. Thank you so much, Miguel. Thank you so much for inviting me to this event. I'm really honored. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to have you. And when we were looking to have guests in on the show, I found that the subject that you teach is very interesting to talk about in an online setting because when we think of mathematics courses traditionally, there's a lot of moving components. We have uh, students that are not only supposed to be able to show that they've done the work correctly, but how they've done the work. And I really want to kind of uh, hone in on your process of how you have been able to enable that in the online setting. What are some ways that you've been able to allow your students to show their work and submit that in an online setting? Great question. So yes, uh, you know, the first time I taught a online class was when I came to FAU. I yeah. did not teach before that. And I found out, oh, we have a wonderful, you know, course is there to help us along the way. So that really helped bring down that, that nervousness that I had, how to do it. Um, so obviously, um, first time teaching online, I realized that, well, I have to do something similar to the in-person. But of course, I can't always mm -hmm. have the students there. But I, like you said, that was the big component, how to make sure that we check all the work that they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so when I built the course the first time, uh, I built an online course with COSI, um, I made sure that the exams, let's see, what did I do? So the exams had basically two components mm -hmm. to it. Um, there was, the exams were created online. I think I used Canvas uh, quiz uh, mm -hmm. as well at one yeah. time. Um, and then, uh, so it's not just about giving the correct answer and getting the points. Yeah. I made sure of that. Mm -hmm. So I kind of divided up the questions so that they will get some points right away if they got the correct answer, yeah. but then they have to actually solve yeah. the problem on paper, submit it on, yeah. through Canvas, and I'm gonna grade it later. Yeah, that's the meat and potatoes of that. Yeah, exactly. that's fantastic. So. Because it's like, you know, and, and that's what we see a lot of the times is we think online and it's, okay, it's just gonna be an exam. I'll punch the box and show that I did the right answer. But I think with mathematics, it is that problem solving aspect. It's not, it's just not the always just the la answer. last answer. It's how yeah. did you go through and get to that point? Yeah. Maybe a slight like, little mistake in the end made a mis you know, mm -hmm. made the answer wrong, which is also a big deal. But if you did yeah. most of the process correct, that'll tell me something about it. Yeah, absolutely. It's knowledge. all about the journey with mathematics. Yes. Yes. So in working with you on building some of your courses, I've noticed that you put a heavy priority into active learning. And I wanted to see if you would talk a little bit about how you integrate that into your online math courses. Yeah, so again, it comes from, again, my experience in the in-person class. I really like the active learning component there. I feel like the students learn better when they discuss among the peers, even mm -hmm. with me in a different setting. Yeah. Like when I'm standing in front of the board and they're asking questions that's different than when I'm going to their table and chatting with them in a friendly mm -hmm. manner or whatever manner and they can ask yeah. more comfortably. And also a presence of a TA or an LA that is uh, you know, another undergraduate student and they yeah. can be more comfortable. Yeah, they're like the champions of what is being taught and they can help you really facilitate. And they also understand the difficulties, the areas that the yeah. students might be having that I might not perceive sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so I always wanted to do that. So the first course I think I built, I did not do that much of active learning. I did do a group work component there mm -hmm. using the group work uh, feature that we have in Canvas. And then it worked well. There were pros and cons yeah. to it. But the students, uh, the idea was uh, the groups were formed between students and they had to come together as a group and solve uh, yeah. problems on a worksheet, they have to submit it. So like I said, there were pro and con. Some people yeah. loved it, loved it. They had those friendly relationship with a few other students. Mm -hmm. They were, But then there were also problems like, oh, hey, Dr. B, this person never works, never yeah. comes in, but gets the point. 
So dealing with those. Yeah. Um, moving forward in the upcoming semester, I'm uh, developing this Calculus One course, and we are going to in incorporate active learning quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, our new QEP at FAU, as you know, has this LA component, the learning assistant, and I'm building that into mm -hmm. the course. So this is a little bit more than just a group work, um, even though it's a, uh, it's a fully online course. So the idea is that the students will be told ahead of time Mm -hmm. that there is a certain time in a week, and the time is just an hour and a half, not a yeah. whole lot of time, that they have to make themselves available. Yeah. And we will form a group, it's not, uh, it's a group of like four or five students, and then there will be an LA present during that time, mm -hmm. but they all get together and they work on a worksheet with the help of the LA. Yeah. And I'm hoping that that will really create that engagement in yeah. the students and uh, the motivation to really work the problem themselves yeah. and not just get the answer from somewhere else and learn that mm -hmm. way better. And I think that way the LA can actually see and maybe even do a little bit of diagnosis That's of it. like, okay, this student may need a little bit more uh, help on this certain topic or maybe we can kind of spend some more time here. But it's like, it's funny because we were talking about that earlier about how there is this thing where when you teach math in person, you can see the look of like, I have no idea what you're mm -hmm. like teaching and I'm just going to sit here and nod and, and <laughs> seem like I know uh, what's going on. But you mentioned that you were able to really address those in person. And I think that this seems like the, the perfect solution to be able to address those online, yes. to really have that sense of community in the online space. And part of the LA model is that the the instructor will meet with the LAs every week mm -hmm. and we will discuss about the class, how it's going, yeah. what they think, that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're yeah. gonna figure out what the students really, what, what they're um, having challenges with, difficulties with, um, maybe particular students even they will say things about, uh, yeah. it's not, it's, it, it's not working very well or whatever. And then we will figure out accordingly yeah. how to make certain modification to help these students. And better. that's, I think that's fantastic because I think on a semester to semester basis, student to student basis even, it's always gonna be in flux as to what the student's comfortable with, what they are you know, able to really take in and put back out. And that allows you to pivot with those needs of the students and really, uh, uh, refine the, the the experience for each student. And uh, if you don't mind, I will tell you one other thing. I yeah. have an idea about this class, and uh, we will see how it comes together. We have to do some assessment um, of student learning. And then one of the ideas that I have is make students um, get engaged in um, kind of not only that how they are understanding, but how also they are discussing with their peers mm -hmm. and um, and doing kind of the group activity. Uh, so one of my idea is to have them create a video, a very short video of solving a problem, yeah. but as a group, not yeah. as just individual, and mm -hmm. they will have to record that and send it to me and I'll take a look at it. That's so they have cool. to come together and they will discuss among themselves so the pieces that they were gonna say it yeah. has to be short, I will, I will make a time limit so it's not very long. So they have to figure out how to, so hopefully that will get, get them engaged. Yeah. That's my, my main concern is that they are not getting engaged. Yeah, well. and I so. think a lot of that is really helping build that group mentality because the one thing that you know I think I've realized as a student myself is that life is group work. Mm -hmm. Life is a big group work assignment and being able to collaborate with your peers and the people around you to get a result is so pivotal. And I think that with these ways of executing a mathematics course, they are gonna actually, it's gonna change the dynamic of what a, uh, what mathematics means to students. You know, it, it will become more of a holistic way of learning how to problem solve instead of I just have to solve problems and then I'll never use this again. Hey, it Which also gives the them a little bit of a confidence in a way to yeah. do it together with some people mm -hmm. and not just individually. And then you're using presentation tactics right. and they're, they're getting uh, comfortable speaking with people and speaking in front of camera and it's there are all these different uh, layers to it that's really... That's exactly the idea and yeah. I do that in my a little bit upper level math classes. I do have them go and do presentation so that they 
can get used to that yeah. concept. And so I'm really trying to do that in the online class. That's yes. exciting. Yes. So I want to kind of go back in time a little bit. Uh, I want to talk about your first experiences teaching online and doing mathematics courses uh, at FAU. And I want you to talk a little bit about how your process has changed throughout the years and like with the advances in technologies, what has evolved in your courses that you feel like has really empowered you uh, in teaching your courses? Sure. Um, so I think the first course was, you know, four years ago or yeah. something, maybe, yeah, four and a half years ago when I developed it. Um, and again, that was the first time I was going to teach online. Um, and at the same time, uh, I was developing an OER for that same course, yeah. Open Education Resource Textbook. Um, so that was a, a huge project that I did in one of the summers, uh, summertime. Uh, so one thing that I really enjoyed right away at FAU, and because I have some experience from before, is using Lightboard to create mm -hmm. videos. That was a big thing. I, I had the experience when I was at Pennsylvania. Uh, I created videos for a textbook. And then I came here and I saw that, oh, my department has a life board. That was wonderful. And I, I knew how to work that. And then Kosi came and helped with all the editing, all the setup, um, everything. Um, so definitely, so in my online, like, like I said, I always had this thought of how to, how to engage student. Can mm -hmm. I engage student? That was always a challenging part and it was fully online course. I at least made sure that I can make myself available and the student can see me as much as they can. Yeah. That I am there. Mm -hmm. that when I'm, I'm doing a problem, they're not just seeing my hands, they're seeing all of me and I'm explaining while I'm solving. So the light board really helped in that, mm -hmm. that they can see. And I have heard from students many times later, I don't even know them and they yeah. know me. They they have seen me and they will come and tell me, it was so cool, you're writing with left hand, backwards, everything was wonderful, you were explaining, I can see you. So that worked pretty yeah. well. So I kept that going in my, uh, in my future classes too. Um, I guess what I, like I said, the, the, the big thing that is going to change is the active learning component. I am going more into it, more detailed, mm -hmm. uh, making sure I can uh, make students uh, really come together as group or with other peers and uh, some LAs or TAs to work things together. Um, and my videos are always going to be there even better probably in a sense that I realize I should not make too long videos. That's mm -hmm. not going to be very useful or students might skip over so yeah. shorter videos more concise um uh, when i make a lecture video i don't do a 30 minute video i mm. will do short lectures pick the topic short ones so that they can easily and and write the names correctly so that they oh i want uh, an idea on the L'Hopital, I am just gonna watch this video. Mm -hmm. I want an uh, example on L'Hopital, I'm gonna watch this video. So break them up so that the students don't get bored, yeah. let's say. Yeah, you're, you're, um, you're diving deep into like that micro learning sort of setup, which right. is great because I think that as a student, if I can't solve a problem, being able to watch it solved repetitively, like on loop or repeat, whatever you wanna call it, um, it can help you really like it's almost like rehearsing. It's like rehearsing before a speech where you are looking at the method, you're looking at the structure and everything as a whole, and then you're mimicking it and then you actually come to really present it in the test and in the assignments that you're doing. Yeah, and another thing, and th this happened uh, like on a mistake. I, I made a mistake in one of the videos. I didn't even catch it. Mm -hmm. And then one time a student came to me and asked me about it. Yeah, hey, I saw this. Uh, this doesn't seem right. And I knew, hey, they're watching the video, right? Yeah. And now my idea is, hmm, should I do that? Should I do that intentionally that in a video? Yeah. yeah. I'll be like, maybe I'll even say it. It's not a tricky thing. I'll probably say that, hey, guess what? Um, I don't know if I did it correctly. Can you guys check? Yeah. Like at the end of the video or something. That's, and then we'll see that. if the students really see it and come back yeah, to me. Because that turns it into a, an I do, we do, yes. or you do sort yeah. of situation. And I try to be interactive as well during the, my videos. Uh, like I'm talking to them really. I'm yeah. asking them questions while I'm writing. Yeah. It's not just plain well, writing. The it. one thing that I loved that we were talking about before we started rolling was that you said that 
I'm not seeing my students, but I'm pretending that the camera is my student because even though you're not seeing the students, the students are seeing you. Exactly. And that's such a huge thing in online learning, that teacher presence, that ability of feeling like I'm not alone in this. It's not just I'm logging in, doing the assignments, and then it goes off into yes. the internet. Uh, so I think that that's really cool that you put that level of attention and detail into your video content and really make it about the students because it's their... They're the ones that are, you know, really accommodating that learning into their knowledge base. And I think that it's a, a wonderful uh, thing to do. Yeah, That's I'm. Awesome. I usually am very, you know, I, first time I started, I was very nervous in front of all this equipment, the camera, mm -hmm. and I had to tell myself, forget yeah. about everything. Just look at that red dot. That's your, That's student, your student that you're teaching, yeah, teaching your that. student. That's how I do it, correct? That's awesome. Yeah. So you talked a little bit about how, um, you know, working with us and working with our department has really empowered you and enabled you to be able to do these things in your courses that you, uh, you kind of have a vision for. Uh, how has COSI changed the way that you think about planning a course? Like what are some things that maybe in other courses that you do that you haven't really started working with us yet or even preparing to work with us? What are some of the things that have changed in your process? I honestly, I had absolutely no idea how to develop and create an online course. My idea was, hey, I will write some notes, I'll put them in, I'll have yeah. some videos, put them in, done, right? So yeah, the Kosi definitely has that complete shell, first of all. Mm -hmm. They're telling me, hey, you have to do an introduction video. You have to do these module introduction videos, yeah. which is so cool. I mean, to tell people uh, exactly what's you know, in the module and very short. And then when it came, came to the module that has exam, I could do a video of telling them something about it. Yeah. And those are the things that little, but they're so important to create mm -hmm. that entire uh, entire course. And I realized that course, it definitely, yeah. definitely helps. All, all the editing, everything, right? The videos have the subtitles and I would never even think about yeah. doing all those technicalities, but they're so important mm -hmm. for students. Yeah. Um, I became more organized, I would say, about writing my notes, creating nice way, the way, readable way, and with, um, with colors, with uh, you know, uh, different manipulatives that definitely helped also. I got these ideas uh, from COSI. And just the support itself. I mean, when I'm like really at that point, I cannot finish this, here comes somebody mm -hmm. from COSI telling me, you can do it. <laughs> yeah. And we did it together. I mean, the help was uh, immense and everything that was already organized so neatly, so nicely. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to worry about any of that. I just do yeah these few things and that you guys take care of the rest. Yeah, and I think that, you know, you touched on something there where I, I you spend, as, as a professional, you spend so much time in your specialization, like gaining that knowledge and obtaining it and being able to work with it and manipulate it. And sometimes that's taxing enough. So when you show up to teach and it's like, well, where do I put this stuff? I have it. It's all ready, but where do I put it? And just having a template or just having someone help kind of guide the stuff into the arrangement, it's completely in your control. You know, you're, you're, yes. you're calling the shots. It's your course. But like, uh, I think it's really uh, a nice thing to have to be able to have someone to show you a scaffolding and give you that first step to going on to your online journey. Yeah. Also, like when I developed the OER textbook, I have to say, you know, um, I had COSI stuff really helped me with editing the textbook. Yeah. Um, so that was a that was a big, huge, huge, huge. Yeah. yeah. To yeah. get that textbook ready and done and ready to go when I wanted it to be to to be ready to go, and the students are using it free of cost. Yeah. It's absolutely amazing experience. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> it looks like we've got a question, so uh, we're gonna. Let that come on in. Okay, so Mary wants to know what LA means. Ah. Um, so LA is a learning assistant. Um, uh, so FAU has this new QEP, and then uh, the director of uh, Math Learning Center, uh, she is in charge of this QEP now, uh, and we are using learning assistant in our classroom. So these are undergraduate students that are, um, who are, no, it, it's different than TA. Uh, not teaching assistants. So they actually have to take a pedagogy class. They have to learn about how to become a learning assistant. They have to learn about the topics. And then, um, so 
I taught with LA in an in-person classroom and I will be teaching with on, in the online setting this uh, in the fall semester. So I can tell you about the in-person. So uh, this is like calculus two, the calculus sequence we have. Um, uh, the classes are two days a week um, and it's uh, about an hour and 50 minutes each day, each class. So what I did as a, as a professor, I would go in the classroom and teach like the first 50 or 60 minutes, depending on you know what the material is, how much time I need. But then the last hour or so will be left for uh, the LAs will be there in the classroom the entire time. And then uh, we'll prepare worksheets ahead of time for the students to work on. Okay, and then the LAs are going around, the students are formed into groups, um, and they are working on the worksheet with the peer and with the help of LA and me too present there. Uh, so it's a complete active learning setting that they are not only just listening to lectures, they're also solving the problems um, in, in the classroom. And then they will have homework to deal with later as well. Um, so that's, that's uh, what LAs do. Uh, also, once a week, the LS will meet with the instructor and go over, uh, talk about the class, the students, and go over the worksheets. So the instructor making sure that the LAs know the topic and how to deal with the questions as well. That's excellent. I, I think that that's, you know, I, we were discussing before uh, we started rolling how LAs change the, uh, the kind of landscape of a mathematics course where it does make it more collaborative and it makes it more of a uh, discussion, you know, you're doing uh, more active learning processes and more authentic, you know, leadership and even a little bit of mentorship there as well. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. And, and these some of the students, they get so interested about this whole yeah. thing. They want to become LA. Yeah. And they're good students that are coming from, you know, these classes and they are getting and that. It's experience. a great experience, too, Very for, for those that might want to be uh, yeah. instructors in the future as well. Correct. Correct. Like I say, I learn a subject better when I teach it, honestly. Yeah. So they are learning that yeah. subject even better when they become the LS. Yeah. yeah. Um, what are some things that you are looking forward to doing in, in online? Like we, we kind of touched upon active learning and the different uh, ways that you are, are really trying to engage your students and, and get them actively participating in the materials. Are there any other uh, things that you're looking forward to integrating? So <clears throat> not on top of my head, like really concrete anything, right? But moving forward, um, so in math, at least I can talk about, uh, there are different courses, uh, lower level math courses or intro level, I should say, when students come in and they're taking it. Sometimes even in the in-person classes, we see that um, things, something's lacking. Mm -hmm. the, the knowledge is not been gained by the students as well, not just in online, but in person too. Mm. So moving forward, you know, I always take examples and experience from online teaching and use it in in person or from in person, use it in online. I kind mm. of go two poles. So really use teaching these different modality classes. I'm trying to come up with ideas to make these other courses better uh, and better in the sense that for better for the students. The students will learn more. Mm -hmm. um, engagement is, of course, necessary. And even in in-person classes, we yeah. sometimes don't see them yeah. engaged as well. So active learning is definitely a big component moving forward. Um, there are many courses we don't have active learning, even in the in-person classes. So I really want to develop that. Mm -hmm. Very, very important classes we have, like college algebra, for example. The first you know, students come in, they take that. Mm -hmm. And they need that knowledge in moving forward in anywhere they go. Yeah. Okay, Math or not math, you know, science, sometimes even non-STEM, they're taking sometimes, um, and then they need that algebra skill. And then we see sometimes it's lacking. Yeah. So moving forward, really the goal is, and I'm writing NSF grant for that as well, goal is to um, use active learning in fully online classes yeah. and in person as well, but focusing on also that fully online sections because that's where we don't know how to engage students yeah. as good as yeah. well. And hopefully this Calc 1, how we are setting it up for a fall semester will give me more ideas mm -hmm. of how to use that in other classes yeah. in a fully online setting and see if we can use some of these ideas there. Yeah, and really just integrate that idea of an active experience into the online learning space. Yes. And then I see we have yes. another question. So uh, I'm going to open it up so that they can ask.
Hi, uh, this is uh, Corey Sorge. Thanks, Poppy. This is very interesting. You have Thank an you. interesting perspective, uh, as opposed to maybe some professors here at FAU, that you have put together a textbook, in this case, an OER textbook, and have done development on a lot of uh, video resources. Which do you feel is the bigger bang for your buck and why? And I'll just leave it at that. Corey, can you repeat the last part? You've, you've done the, the textbook side where yes. there's a lot of written resources that people can read through. Oh. And you've done the video aspects where people can be more of a consumer and whatnot. Which do yeah. you feel is the bigger bang for your buck in terms of your time resource? Oh, 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 uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a very challenging time, by the way, when I had to do both at the same time. So I realized that, you know, students are not really picking up textbook and, and reading that. That's, that's a big, big problem we have. Um, so when I created this e-textbook, well, you know, it wasn't completely written by me. Uh, there was a textbook already available and it was free. Um, and I took that, I, I adapted that, I, I added more stuff that we need for this course. I changed sections. I rewrote some uh, some of the topics. Uh, I adapted it. Um, so I, I hope that the way I was writing the textbook was in an explanatory way. So even when solving a problem, it's not just showing the steps, but kind of putting their words like why we're doing this, what we're doing. And then on top of that, I put videos in the textbook too added videos there. So my hope was that the student will pick up probably, hopefully to watch the video and then they will see, oh, an example sitting right there and they will read it. Um, to me, it was it was a lot of work working on the textbook, absolutely. That took a lot of the time. The, the video preparing that came a little bit easier to me because I had the experience uh, before, I would say. And like I, like I said, it was all like just teaching in classroom to me. Uh, but yeah, d writing the textbook took quite a bit of time, but go see uh, Abigail uh, really helped me in editing and, and, and completely um, getting it all done, I would say. Um, um, but it took a lot of time. And how much the students are using it, honestly, I don't know, but I think I know this, that they are solving problems from the exercise of the textbook. So they are picking it up, they are looking at it. That I know because they will come to me almost every semester and ask for, hey, can I get the answers? And I have to say, I don't have the answers prepared yet, but soon. <laughs> I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Yeah, I think it did. Okay. Now, um, I kind of want to get back into the uh, media conversation because you, you really you do a lot with the Lightboard technology and um, you actually uh, talked a little bit about ways to do almost a multimodal sort of approach. Like, well, you're, you're already doing that with the textbook, which yeah. I think is excellent because it, it really accommodates the different uh, learners and the different styles and the ways that they like to uh, consume the content. Um, what are some ways that you are looking to innovate with Lightboard in the future? Like, what, what are some? That's a very good question. And you know, I have been I have been thinking about that because sometimes, maybe most of the times, the problems we are solving, and I try to solve not the simplest problems, mm -hmm. but maybe it's more complicated ones so when I'm doing in Lightboard. And then space is always an issue. It's not yeah. the, the largest you know, a uh, uh, board to, to work on, to write on. And that is always a problem. And, you know, if you have worked on light with Lightboard, you know that it's very um, challenging to erase. Yeah. So uh, once you complete it, it takes some time to erase everything and then write. So I cannot have a problem. I'm doing it and then erasing. It's not like chalkboard or, or, mm -hmm. or, or our smart boards and then we keep on writing. It's not like that. So you have to be very careful. And those are the technical things I have learned. Um, so we cannot make it bigger, it's one size. Yeah. So I always wondered if there is a way to incorporate like portion of the things already there and mm -hmm. not necessarily written by me. Yeah. Maybe some PowerPoint will be there on one side and then I solve the remaining part. So yeah. dividing it up in such a way so I don't have to erase, yeah. but you can see both. You can have some, like maybe recap some of these formulas and I don't want to write all of this down or I yeah. don't have space. 
So how about a recapping part will be shown along with then I'm showing the problem. Yeah, I, I can definitely see there being a benefit from uh, putting in some concrete elements that even maybe, I don't know if there's a way to like stick it on the other side, right. and write it in there and right. then what you're erasing will not impact what needs to be there, but yes. allow you to build off of it yes. as you go forward. Yeah, for math at least I feel like that will be kind of helpful. Yeah. Moving forward, you'll have, if you can if you can figure that out. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yes. yes, but you know, technology itself, like I said, is always wonderful to be present in front of your student. You're talking and and you're writing and getting yeah. edited and everything. Yeah. And just, uh, it's yeah. already in itself is a wonderful technology. I wouldn't change anything, but mm -hmm. the space is the problem. That's all. Yeah. That's my issue. Yeah, uh, drawing on it is not the best thing for me when I draw. Uh, X, Y axis and a graph, I always get wiggly lines and yeah. those other things. I feel like if we prepare some things ahead of time yeah. and, and then... If, if you're anything like me, it's getting the line wrong is just going <laughs> to... Yes. Arr, I <laughs> yes. want to make sure that it's good the first time. Exactly. Looks like we got another question. So yes. we're going to let them unmute and... Um, I'm assuming that was based on, on the fact that I had my hand up. And mine is not so much a question but to say that I honor you for your creative use of the tools and then your wisdom to try to think how to improve on where you are and how to get where you need to be. That's, that's, uh, that is delightful. Thank you for, thank you for being there and doing that and being able to get your students actively involved in something as abstract as calculus is phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much for that. Yes. So I want to talk real quick uh, about my open math. Okay. Uh, I've really outside of the courses that we've developed together, I haven't seen it utilized a lot, but it's a very interesting service because it is at no cost to the students. And I just wanted to kind of see if you'll talk a little bit about how you integrate that into your course. How does that, uh, what ways are you integrating it? And of course, uh, what are some ways that you find it is a, a creative solution to some uh, limitations that you have in the online space? Absolutely. So yeah, when I was given this task, again, four or five years ago, of developing the OER for the Methods of Calculus class, and we, uh, we were, uh, as a committee, we were trying to, we were looking at uh, different areas. And then we found um, the, the textbook, uh, OER textbook, and the My Open Math associated mm -hmm. with it. So the people who created it, they got a big NSF grant to create it, and it's all free. And I think now hundreds of uh, yeah. colleges are using uh, this. So when I saw it, I honestly, I, I, I thought this was very parallel to like a My Math Lab that mm -hmm. Pearson has. Yeah. It, it is of no cost. Now, there's, of course, pros and cons to that, right? The pro is, yes, no cost. Con is, oh, troubleshooting. What do we do? Um, honestly speaking, this last four years, I've been using it for almost every course. Mm -hmm. And I did not have much issue at all. Maybe yeah. a few faculty had some issues. But the person who creates and who, who takes care of it, we just send him an email and he immediately responds. He immediately tries to fix things. Yeah. It, it hasn't given us much of a trouble. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I use that as part of the assessment system uh, for methods of calculus, mm -hmm. for example. Um, um, and then uh, there are some other uh, courses, I think they're also using uh, yeah. the same, same thing. Uh, so we use it mainly for homework purposes, so the student can do all the homework there. Some people use it for exams as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I personally, for methods of calculus, um, in-person classes, I do not use this for exams, only for final exam. Um, so one thing is what happens when you can create the questions, you can mm -hmm. write the problems. Yeah. You just have to know the code a little bit. So you have to, And uh, once you start writing, you will figure out it's not too bad. If you know yeah. LaTeX, you know how to write the code a little bit. So, um, and then once it's written, you can actually give a permission for others to use or you keep it personal. Mm -hmm. So people usually write the code and then let it accessible to everybody. Yeah. So the, the good part is you can just, I need a topic, I, I need to find questions on derivative and you just hit that 
write that down in the in the search box and it'll give you all the questions that are available. And you can oh. choose from the list what you want. And then what I do, I like a question, but let's say I don't like all of it or I want to add more to it. Mm -hmm. I just open it up and I can edit the problem as I seem fit. Yeah. And it's my problem now. That's awesome. So there's so many things you can do. It's absolutely wonderful. Yeah. You can add, you, you can have questions where the students will draw mm -hmm. and then it, you have to correct it. You have to grade it later because pictures can be different, yeah. but you can have those type of interactive questions as well. They're, yeah. they're wonderful. That is wonderful. And it is getting better and better. It's getting the, the again, the person who created it, he's mm -hmm. putting more stuff, he's developing it, and it's making it better. So yeah. everybody to use. Yeah. And I really like the idea that you can make it your own because I think that, you know, with online courses, sometimes those questions, they, they make their way out. And, you know, unfortunately, mm -hmm. that is a thing that we yeah. encounter. And but making it something that you've created is a unique experience that they're not going to. Yeah, and all random well. questions, every student gets a different question yeah. anyway, so mm -hmm. that's also there. Now, um, for My Open Math, uh, does that enable students to show their work, or is that something you can. that... You can okay. make that part of it, yes. That's awesome. Yes. I absolutely. didn't realize that, because, you know, when you think of yes. online uh, tools for Correct. mathematics, you think of just hit the yeah. visit A through D and then kind of answer as such, but being able to include the logic in that is really a powerful Yeah, even asset. for methods of calculus class, the uh, fully online section, I have uh, that incorporated. They, I created the exams and then every question, or not maybe every question, but the questions where they can write and show work, yeah. uh, that is incorporated there. Yeah, yes. absolutely. It looks like we've got another question. Yeah, so the question in the chat is, does my math, oh, sorry, does my open math still work within the Canvas environment? Yes. Yes, it does. Yes, that's what we have been doing. Uh, that's been the, the very exciting part of it is its integration into uh, the Canvas uh, courses that we build and allowing the grades to kind of carry over and, and do all those different things. And I think I should add this, that because that was a concern I had, if we are doing exams and we can also incorporate Honor Lock and Lockdown Browser associated with it, That's even excellent. though it's an external, yeah. uh, external yeah. uh, thing. That's yes. very powerful. Correct. So um, now we kind of talked a little bit about uh, your assessment process. Uh, what are some ways that you, uh, you accommodate a student that might be struggling? If you have a student that is maybe not performing to the caliber of other students, is are there any ways that you allow them or, or enable them to kind of build that comfort with the content and with the subject before moving forward? Or are there any solutions that you have to that? Communication is a big thing. Yeah. Um, it always happens. Students struggle. Um, I am very big with identifying right away uh, who is not performing well and communicating with them. Now, mm -hmm. honestly, it is challenging in both in person and online. Like in the summer, just summer semester, um, the very first week, they were like, half of my class didn't come to class. And I was getting so worried they will probably drop or what is gonna mm -hmm. happen. And I had no other way of communicating but write an email and, and like, really tell them that I care for them. I want them to show mm -hmm. up, otherwise they will not learn. And then it worked. It worked. They did communicate. So yeah. I feel the same thing with online. You know, it doesn't matter what type of mm -hmm. class I'm teaching. I really communicate with the students right on time and make sure they know that I really do care. Yeah. I want them to be successful. I want them to, um, to not lag. And I tell them, listen, yeah. you... If you are not doing this ass ass assignment, for example, and you might later will ask, hey, this is what happened, or I could not do it. I, and, and I'm very strict about the rules that I put down in my syllabus. I'm very fair to my students. Mm -hmm. I tell them this from the first day, that if I will, I cannot, I will not do something just for one individual. Yeah. If I make any changes to my rules, I'll make it for everybody. Okay. So the, the main thing is, no, you are not going to get any extra time 
without any appropriate reasoning, yeah. uh, what is written in my syllabus is, is going to be done for so, you. But so I'm very, at very a, a fair. Full, yes. A full playing field of that. That's wonderful. Yes. I tell them ahead of time, listen, no, no slack there. There is yeah. nothing you can do to change yeah. that mind. But I also like that you're addressing needs on a one-to-one -one basis and kind of yes. as they come in. I even tell them, even in an online, I told them many times I had this situation. I said, talk to me, come to my Zoom. Um, I will create an office hour just for you. I'm going to sit down with you. Tell me what your difficulties are. I'm willing to explain. But mm -hmm. you have to make that commitment, of course. Yeah. I cannot do everything. Yeah, I can try to help. Street. Yeah. I can try to help, but you have to take that help and you have to go with it. That's excellent. So we are uh, coming to the close. I want to thank you again so much for joining us on our inaugural episode of Faculty Lounge Live. Um, and I want to just open it up. If there are any questions that any of our lovely guests have, uh, feel free to ask them now. Uh, and we'll leave it open until we are uh, ready to call it close. So uh, once again, thank you so much for no, joining us. No, thank you us. so much for letting me do this. This is great. Yes. Oh, I, I, I love that You know, I was able to do this first one with you because we, we have built very unique courses uh, together. And you. you know, mathematics, like I said in our uh, initial talks before we started, uh, it's one of those things that really uh, is kind of elusive in the online space and right yes you know it being is. able to solve those problems individually correct yeah like I said I mean we have we know how to face students in the classroom and see what is going on and decide based on that but in online we have that lacking and we have to figure out ways yeah to make up for that mm -hmm. and make sure the students still learning and, yeah. uh, and gaining the knowledge that we need them to, we want them to. Yeah, so. and really I, I think that along with the innovations that you've added to uh, your courses and the new things that you're testing out with the learning assistance and you know uh, the QAP program, uh, being able to run it and test it out is really, uh, that's gonna be equally as helpful as the innovation itself. And being there, the COSI really, really helps, uh, honestly, that way. I mean, if I had to do it all by myself, it would be it would be uh -huh. a real challenge. Yeah. So having that support and help at FAU is absolutely wonderful. Yeah, yes. awesome. Well, thank you again for joining us. Uh, we're going to call it here. Uh, this video will be up on our YouTube at the end of this week, so you'll be able to watch the recorded version. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.